Well, hello everyone and welcome to this special webinar from the International Port Community Systems Association exploring the future of data exchange between logistics stakeholders. I'd like to thank IPSCA and their team for working with PTI to present you this webinar and their continued collaboration with us here at Port Technology International across our editorial content and our events. I'd also, of course, like to congratulate them on their 10th anniversary. Our chairman, Hans Rook, and the other speakers will be providing a lot more detail about the association's achievements to date and what the future holds for them. As with all of our webinars, we will have a live Q&A session following the presentations. So please do make this as interactive as possible by using the questions tab on the right hand side. Plus, if you're interested in speaking one to one with Richard Morton, Secretary General at the Association, please let us know in the comments section and we will be able to facilitate this for you. Finally, Generously, ITSCA has purchased up to 30 port technology subscriptions, which it is going to be giving out to some of those in attendance today. If you are particularly interested in access to Port Technology International's journals and exclusive su subscriber content, do let us know in the chat. I'll now hand over to our chairman, Hans Rook, to introduce the webinar and our fantastic lineup of speakers. Over to you, Hans. Yes, thank you, Beth, for the uh, introduction given. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. But before I will say a welcome to you to the webinar, I have an announcement to make, a very sad one. Yesterday, we received a very sad message that Dominique Le Breton of MGI Marseille died caused to by a road accident this weekend. We are all shocked by this news, knowing Dominique not only as a business partner, but especially as a friend. An IPCSA family member in heart and soul. Our thoughts go to his family, his friends, and all the colleagues of MGI. We will remember Dominique as a cheerful and positive friend, as a proud representative of MGI. Today, you will imagine that our thoughts are with him and his family, and I'm sure he will sit on our shoulder during this webinar. May I ask you, in memory of Dominique, for one minute of silence. Thank you. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the respect shown. And uh, as I said to you, to you, he will be on our shoulder during the webinar. But back to uh, the reality of today. Uh, welcome. Welcome at the IPCSA webinar hosted by Port Technology International about the future of data exchange between logistics stakeholders. A special welcome to our founding members and our global members on this special event. Today, your IPCSA celebrates the 10th year anniversary. Your IPCSA because it's our task to give you as members, PCS, cargo community systems, single window operators, a face and a voice on an extensive international platform. Therefore, six founding members worked closely together to create the European Port Community System Association in 2011. 
this to get PCS, cargo community systems and single window operators known within those organizations that announce recommendations, regulations, and legislation. From childhood, grown up to an adult association, we are today recognized as an important party representing global operators that form the critical infrastructure in the sea and airports for enhancing trade facilitation. Creating the optimum performance of ports in handling cargo, ships and air freight. We are very proud to have achieved the special NGO status on UN level. And apart from this, we are considered and recognized as experts on levels such as APEC, EU, IMO, ICAO, IATA, FIATA, ISO, World Economic Forum, World Customs Organization. We work close together with associations like FONASPA, the Inter-American Community on Ports, CIP, Procomex Brazil, development banks and countries to assist them in establishing port community systems as an important part of the port infrastructure. Today, IPCSA counts around 50 members globally representing about 500 sea and airports, inland terminals and border crossing. Of course, we look forward to extend our group of members to be able to represent them and bring them in contact with their colleagues to exchange views. Let us stay your voice on those important platforms. Ladies and gentlemen, I will hand over now to our Secretary General, Richard Morton, who will open the floor for our speakers and for of today. I wish you all a very pleasant and informa informative session. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It is a pleasure to be here, and it is my honor to have acted as Secretary General for the International Port Community Systems Association for the last 10 years. What I will do now is just share with you a bit about uh, who IPSCA is and where we came from, um, so that you can actually understand more around who we are. So, as IPSCA, we formed in 2011, 10 years ago. It seems like yesterday to many of us. And our role has changed and adapted in that time. We came from having six members representing in five countries in Europe to over 50 members operating in well over 50 countries um, today. That's a huge expansion. We went from 20 seaports to well over 500 seaports, airports, inland border crossings and single windows around the world. We went from those six members in Europe and their users to members across the world from China, um, such as Logink, one of our members in China, to some of the smallest, uh, Port St. Martin in the Caribbean. In excess of 2 billion electronic messages a year were exchanged when we first messaged, when we first formed between those six members and their communities. That's now is in excess of over 50 billion messages of all types, of all technologies, of all ways. And we're looking, if we're looking just at container cargoes, over 500 million TEUs go through our member systems on an annual basis. 
But we are a community of communities as an association. We talk about the Ipska family, Protec. Protec was a group that was formed in the 1990s to develop EDI messaging for port authorities. They created those well-known messages such as Berman, was this waste disposal and also the IFTD GN message. As of the beginning of this year, they integrated into IPSCA fully and we now work with all of the ProTec members in order to make sure that ports and port authorities have the right messaging, technology um, and data formats and standards available. Um, but we aren't a standards body. We just support those international standards bodies that are there. We also needed to change and adapt ourselves. When we formed, we were sending emails and PDFs of new newsletters. In recent years, we created our own bespoke private social media network just for our members. So we have a secure and safe place to communicate with others. And within our own community, we have trusted friends on there sharing their news, sharing their information. It brings our family together. And then in the last year, we have done one specific initiative, plus many others, of course, on trying to connect our members for global, global exchange, supporting the transparency in the supply chain. And as Hans has already mentioned in his opening, we have representation from across the world. We formed in order to work with the European Commission and their new uh, 2010 65 the maritime single window uh, directive but since then we've expanded covering all aspects of the world all modes of transport all organizations and work actively in promoting the neutrality and trusted nature of port community systems cargo community systems and single windows around the world and we thank all of those organizations some are here today who have supported us in that journey and it has been a journey but we have a saying in Ipska, in order to stay the same, you have to change. We could have formed 10 years ago and stayed what we were doing. We formed as a European association, but within three years we became international because it was recognized we were getting members from Australia, Israel, Ukraine, Africa, South America, North America. And so we needed to create that global recognition of the value of sharing data in the logistics sector. Mm -hmm. We were recognized at a European level and now at an international level. We started off with just members as port community systems and port authorities. We've led to cargo community systems and airports as members and single windows. So we have public, private, public-private partnerships as members, all sharing and exchanging their experience and knowledge worldwide. The majority of our members focused on Edifac when we started 10 years ago, and now looking at the newer technologies, blockchain and particularly API. And we went from just commenting on policies to actually influencing policies at regional, national and global levels. But as Apesca, it's not just about talking, it's about action. So we have to follow those things up. It's about making sure that we can actually develop those initiatives that we have. We thank all of our members for all of the work that they have done over the years. And in order to support us in all of the initiatives from our blockchain initiative for uh, the blockchain bill of lading through to standards definitions, standards message formats, and the work that is done within all of the international organizations. Hans and I can't do this by ourselves. We are very much reliant on our members. And finally, now we're focusing around our network of trusted networks, which aims to facilitate a neutral and global scalable collaborative solution amongst poor community systems and single windows around the world. It's a governance platform, not a data platform. It's about sharing your business and your data across borders in an easy and simple way. And that is something that we believe truly in that actually in order to support the global logistics community as all of our members in that we need to support the sharing of data across borders. And with our membership now in over 
500 sea and airports in over 50 countries. We're in a key position to support that. So I wanted to just share with you all of the work that has been done over the 10 years, briefly. And later on, you will hear from the speakers about where the future lies. But to me, it is just an honor to have so many friends around the world supporting the work that Ipsca does and that I and Hans do. And we'd like to thank you once again for all of the support. Back to you, Hans. Thank you, Richard, for uh, the opening words and your uh, explanation about the things we are doing and we still have to do and what we are going forward in. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have today four speakers uh, telling about uh, various subjects about um, Network Trust Network, where um, um, Richard already hit it upon. What is a real single window today about the Air PCS? So beautiful presentation from Ahmad. And last but not least, we have Uwe Liebschner telling about our customs expert, experts, telling about what we are doing on customs level. First, I would like to give the floor to Javier Gallardo. Javier is the CEO of Porting Barcelona, one of the founding members, and also our vice chairman of IPCSA, and of course, a dear friend. Uh, Javier, will you bring into the uh, present and future of, uh, of data exchange in seaports and how to exchange information between various parties? Javier, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Hans, for your, inter for your introduction. It's a pleasure for me to participate in this webinar. Uh, first of all, I want to join again my condolence to my friend uh, Dominique. We have lost one of us. It's a uh, deep, deep. Uh, I'm very, very sorry. Um, well, well, in the aim of my presentation is to present what is been the what's been the this chain, the data chain in the sim ports in the past, today, and in the future. So during this, let's say more than four, 40 years than the PCR are working in our ports, we have been doing a lot of things. In this in this slide, you can see the three columns that shows the past, the present, and the present or or today, basically on the twenties. We when we started in the in the in the past eighties, we have the PCS, we have the carrier systems with the terminals and the administrations. Nowadays, we have more systems working in the in our ports. Basically, the concept of the single windows, the national single window, the European single windows. And now we are also seeing how new global trade portals are joined in that interactions in a more global scale. Also, the architecture of this system has been uh, evolving from the typical one, the happen and spoke architecture. And now we are seeing how the distributed architecture basing on the distributed ledger or blockchain are appearing and also taking place in a way to uh, show how the information is flowing worldwide. Also, our centric database store in our data in our, in our database centers are evolving to a distributed database. So again, the blockchain technology, this is disrupting technology, is shaking and shocking the actual global trade and the global exchange. Of course, we are seeing how this uh, evolution is moving. So basic, basing on this architecture of Hub and Spork, the typical architecture of messaging, message forward and store is moving to the information is stored in one place and is retrieved using a URL. So now there is no, there is no need to uh, resend and replicate the information going through. So basically, we are seeing that information is stored somewhere and it's located, searchable, and then you can retrieve. Of course, we are seeing how the things are also uh, evolving in terms of security. Uh, in the past and nowadays, all the stakeholders 
in the in the in the in the pores trust in the PCS. The PCS was considered a third trusted party, but now we also introduced the concept of the trust in technology on the blockchains. So this is an again where the technology is creating, uh, is putting a new a new tool to uh, to create more secure uh, more secure environment. In the past, we have all, we have PCs, we have service. Now it's also it's our the, the mobiles and the phones are taking a big place on our communication. But now we'll see that in the future, nowadays, any device connected to internet will be a source or source of information. And this information will be dealt and managed by the PCS. Of course, again, new evolution in terms of the network connectivity. In the past, we have the LAN, the WAN, now the 4G and the 5G are providing this is great connectivity to the to the to the information and the trade we also are uh, the information that is exchanging is exploding the volume of data is, is increasing every day in the past we, we were talking about kilobytes megabytes but now we can talk about gigabytes terabytes pet, petabytes so the volume of data that are we are transacting is huge and it's increasing every day also, the formats, the whole bunch, the formats of the message has been uh, uh, increasing. As uh, in the past, we were used to work on Edifac, NCX, X12. Uh, nowadays, we introduce XML, JSON. But now, in, in today, we also have to introduce natural language. So we are able to process natural language in part of our messages. And this is all will, will, be, will be a reality in, in the future. The files, the files we we used to transact files in text, but now we trans we trans we transact uh, files in text binary. But also we are going to manage video and streaming. So this is another great uh, evolution. Of course, we are using uh, we are we were used to uh, use protocol communication protocols FTP MTP then appears the HTTP, the SMS, and now we also are able to share information use, using another pro communication protocol, even based on uh, on social network like Telegram or WhatsApp or Facebook. Uh, here it's again, I want to highlight this concept. In the past, we were very focused on the poor optimization, how this, how the information makes our poor more, more, uh, more optimize it now nowadays we also focus on how to optimize not only our poor to optimize our hinterland we were talking in a domestic but the real future and today we have to think on the global supply optimization to door to door so so in the past we were focused on giving that poor traceability in our poor we extend that traceability to our hinterland and now the, the, the demands of the markets is the door-to-door -door traceability from end to end. So that implies a big synchronization and a, a, implies a lot of things in terms of traceability, standardization, and globality. In the past, we were talking about documents that what happened in the past, documents and event. Today, uh, or maybe today, we also transact documents that happens in the past, but what is happening now but in the future, or, or maybe tomorrow, we also sharing the information what is going to happen. So this is another important fact. Not only the old data, live data, we are going to, back to, to use the predicted data. Here, the use of the new uh, mechanisms of machine learning and AI will be totally part of our uh, daily, daily work. In the past, we were more focused on integration, how to integrate our, how to integrate our systems. Today, we also integrate and we also automate their systems to be more uh, more efficient. But also in the today and the future, we more focus on, of course, integration, automation, optimization. So using the information that is going to happen, we will be able to optimize our process to make our port more efficient. And I think that in the end, another important uh, 
concept that I want to highlight in, in this part is that we were accustomed, we were used to have a human making decision process where we have the information and then we be able to make a, uh, make better decision. But tomorrow, this decision will make will be done will will be taken by machines. So the concept of synchro modality, physical internet will be a reality. So the information will be receiving will be received in some system and the system will be able to make that decision on time to choose which is the best route or which is the best mean of transport to, to choose. So this is basically I will I have tried to make a short path, a short route, uh, what is what happened in the past, what is happening now, uh, what is going to happen in the future in the data exchange in the in our in our system. So and also I want to um, again to grab some words from from Lita to say if we want to stay on the same place we have to move and here is what is showing here if we want to be in the same place we have to use and to adopt the new technologies and the new concepts to to do what we have been doing during these years so in my previous slide, I made some comments regarding to PCS and the global trade systems or the global traceability. I present in the, in the left side, you have the, the system of the PCS where the multiple actors in the port connects to the PCS exchanging the information. So, but on the on your right side, in the upper, in the upper side, I put on a slide from the Cassandra project in 2011 where the concept of the global pipeline was initially concept uh, designed. The idea is to have a, this global data pipeline where multiple actors were able to publish this, this information. That was a, an idea or a concept that was presented in that in, in 2011, if I remember well. And now in the bottom line, in the bottom, sorry, in the bottom of the right, you see, for instance, this is a picture of the trail lanes. Trail lanes, uh, this is the initiative of IBM or MERS. It's a distributed ledger based on the blockchain technology with the idea of uh, publishing all the events from the end to end, from the from the from the beginning, from the origin to the destination. So here is more focus on the global traceability and the global uh, optimization of the supply chain. And this is what we have to aim. Now the world is global, and the supply chains are global. We have to look why so the future will be how to create this global integration to end to end so this is part of the of the my thoughts of this slide but however we have this idea in mind we still have a lot of change a lot of challenge the same challenge that we have been facing during the, during these years we have challenge on the standards and harmonizations about the semantic data and process we all need to work and to understand the same thing. So this is, 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 is a challenge to face. Another is the di digital identity. Who is, who is authorized? Who is, who is the responsible identify the sender of the information is in the end, the final, let's say, responsible of the action. So we have to trust on third parties in order to identify and to authorize the actors. Another issue is the legal framework. More, more if we are talking uh, worldwide, so cross-border regulation, this is a nightmare because it's not the same, the regulations in Spain, Europe, that in Asia. So to make and harmonize this process is always is, is really challenging. Another important issue is that something that we have been working for many years from the very beginning in the poor communities is the change management. How to make these things to real change, how to make the change of sending information, uh, how to make all the companies and the stakeholders to work in the same way or trying to do in a similar way. It's a real challenge thing. Of course, there are a lot of things related to data ownership and data protection. Another important thing is about the value of the data, how to monetize these informations. This is part of the, of the things that we have started to work on, on the network of trusted networks, how, how to make this evaluation of 
of the of the information in terms of the how to make these governance is the different governance models how to make the governance between the sender the receiver the publish the subscription and finally last but not least is the cyber security this is for me is one of the biggest concerns that we have the information is there but we are we have the threat of the bad ones very, very near, and we have to be very care of all of this. So this is my presentation. I hope you find it interesting. Um, I hand over to Hans, I think. Yes, Javier, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, well, I remember the FP7 project, the Cassandra project, because that was the first time we met each other. And became friends forever i think and uh well the the pipelines are well known and these days we are talking about pcs communication and network trusted network but we come back later to that in the q a i'm i'm sure about that so i would um, now introduce please introduce our next speaker our next speaker coming from morocco Youssef awuzi uh he is the ceo of portnet today and he will um, um bring us into the world of their single window and trade facilitation. The great thing of the Moroccan system is that when you and I talk about uh, single windows, we talk about maritime single window or European single window or custom single window, it's all business to government. But when we look and zoom in, and Yusuf will do that, uh, into the situation in Morocco, you will see that business to business, business to government, and the other way around is all uh, handled by the single window of um, uh, Portnet model. So, Yusuf, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you, Hans, for your your, your invitation to share with you our um, our vision to the future of single windows. First, I I want to share uh, our deepest sympathies uh, with the family of uh, Dominique and. Uh, and, uh, our colleagues in uh, MGI. We were heartbroken when uh, we had the sad news. Uh, Dominique was a uh, was a friend and a colleague, and may uh, he rest uh, in peace. I just will. Uh, first, uh, I will uh, start by a quick uh, uh, presentation of Portnet, so uh, everybody can. Uh, Keep with me uh, with uh, with uh, our presentation. So, Portnet is a tool of uh, the Moroccan uh, government for the implementation of uh, several uh, sector strategies to improve the business environment, trade, logistics, and the competitiveness of uh, our um, companies. Uh, our governance uh, involves all the national economic operator, and uh, the importer and the exporter are in the center of our interest. Our vision is to become uh, and remain a reference in the integration of supply chain and uh, the stimulation of international inclusive trade uh, to include the sustainable development goal. And our mission is to constantly accelerate and inspire through innovation, the use of technology and uh, community intelligence, the competitiveness of Moroccan uh, foreign trade and uh, logistics. Uh, here are uh, here are some of our um, ecosystem figures. We are we are handling more than uh, one one hundred twenty uh, online services for our businesses and community. We are ha we're having uh, more than sixty thousand users that are using our platform uh, daily, and we are integrating a lot of administration operators, ports, and uh, aeroports also. Uh, agents, uh, shipping agents, and uh, so many other uh, type of users and uh, communities. Uh, the future of uh, single windows will be. Um, I, I think there are three, uh, three, uh, uh, three uh, ways of uh, of uh, for the for the future of the single window. There are technologies, there are globalization, and there are also the integration. For the technology, uh, there are ways to keep up with trend in technology. As you know, uh, we are in uh, the fourth and the same revolution, and technology is evolving faster than, than ever. And uh, Javier has uh, pointed that, that there is a lot of 
uh, new technologies and uh, companies and individuals uh, that don't keep up with uh, some of these major techno te technology trends run the risk of being left behind. So single windows, among others, should prepare and grasp the opportunities allowed by those uh, new trend technology, like blockchain, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data analytics, uh, uh, LPR, uh, and also internet, internet of, of things. Uh, one uh, another new technologies that uh, that are used a um, lot uh, can be also the future of uh, uh, the integration of uh, single windows is also EPI. Uh, I, I think I, uh, EPI. So with the with the, uh, this uh, type of uh, of uh, of. Um, uh, uh, EPIs we can we can uh, bring to our community a new open innovation platforms that brings data and uh, EPIs to our community so they can use uh, all this technological uh, platform uh, with an ecosystem uh, that can be used for for example for big companies uh, inventors startups so they can uh, bring new solution to our uh, to uh, to their to their to their customer and uh, to their uh, companies using the data and the technological uh, uh, API platform that can uh, can be built by very uh, single windows in the future. There are also um, a race toward globalization, uh, as you know. Uh, uh, the digitalization of uh, international trade began by uh, the digitalization of uh, of uh, all the players to the implementation of information system. Uh, so every player in the in the in the trade uh, value chain has uh, come up with a project to uh, digitalize the. Um, the, system, the information system and to enhance the internal processes and the quality of service delivered uh, to their customer. Uh, by bringing those information system, they need to interconnect uh, this, uh, this uh, system. So there are, uh, we come up with the uh, community system platform like uh, port community system, cargo community system, and as well as single windows. Uh, the scope of those platform is connecting public and uh, private uh, actors, but an, at the national level. Uh, but recently, there is a need of uh, globalization. Those uh, platforms need to be connected. So a global platform are emerging uh, to interconnect those uh, platform, uh, single windows, community, uh, cargo community system, a port community system uh, to aggregate those network uh, so uh, they can offer um, a door-to-door -door, uh, solution for their customer. Uh, so those one-stop platform, trade platform can connect the public sector, international organization, private sector uh, to, uh, with a lot of uh, platforms like e-commerce platform, freight for water platform, uh, port community systems, cargo community systems, banks, and also carriers and freight for water. And uh, with this uh, one-stop platform, we can have uh, more services, uh, more traceability and uh, tra uh, traceability for all the, uh, the shipments uh, for uh, for. Um, all the businesses and have door-to-door uh, -door services for all the, uh, the shipments. Uh, I think uh, Richard speak about uh, network of trusted method. Uh, I think it's uh, one of the solutions for single windows to globalize. So uh, uh, with uh, this, uh, this, uh, this solution, uh, we uh, bring this uh, globalization to single windows so we can uh, bring information from uh, from uh, other single windows PCS and uh, network, trusted network, and can we can give uh, more um, services to our to our community here in Morocco. Uh, 
There are also risks to one integration, as you know, uh, uh, the by ship uh, pay model uh, uh, distinguish three different vertical uh, classes in the technical infrastructure established uh, to 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 modelize uh, the vision of the international trade with the Dubai, which is, which is uh, how we uh, we. Uh, uh, we agree a contract from uh, from uh, with uh, an important exporter. How to ship with all the what we are doing in PCS, like uh, uh, the organization of uh, of uh, the import and the export in the ports or airports, and also the pay how we pay uh, how we pay uh, goods to it, uh, the banks and uh, trade finance platform. And in Morocco, we are working in the in a in a integration of uh, this uh, three type of uh, of verticals by uh, handling a, uh, several projects for example for uh, the buy the, the trade follows we are working on a partner's marketplace for our exporters so they can being more uh, customers to, uh, for their for their goods here in uh, in Morocco, and they can uh, handle all the the, the trade follows. Uh, for the logistic uh, follows, we are working a lot uh, with uh, important uh, single windows in the ports, airports, so we can bring more uh, more uh, more info logistic information in the single windows, so we can uh, give more. Uh, uh, information to our customer how uh, the logistic is, uh, is working and give them a lot of analytics about that. We are working also in uh, the funding with the financial flow, uh, flow, uh, with trade finance. We are working in our project uh, uh, Trade Direct, Partner Trade Direct, which is uh, will, uh, will help uh, our uh, community to. Uh, uh, to digitalize all the trade finance uh, operation with the banks and uh, with their uh, customer uh, at an international level. Uh, I think this is uh, for us um, the uh, the future uh, as we see it here in Morocco. More integration uh, here locally, uh, so we can bring more uh, solution for our for our communities like uh, the marketplace. Uh, more integration in the logistic uh, in the logistic uh, part, so we can give more uh, information about uh, the uh, supply chain to our to our uh, to our customers, so we can they can automatize uh, they can digitalize internally and uh, bring more automation in, uh, in the supply chain and also with uh, uh, the trade finance i think uh, it's uh, very important to to bring more solutions simple solutions to our customers so they can handle these payments very uh, smoothly and also for the anti for the, the globalization integrate we should uh, the single window should integrate uh, international trade platform, global platform, so we can uh, bring more, uh, more information to our, uh, to our community about what happened also at an international level. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your, uh, for your listening. I think it's uh, okay for my presentation. If there is any question, I am... Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I will be happy to, uh, to, to, to answer. Thank you very much. Hans. Well, thank you very much, Youssef, for your, uh, well, very broad explanation about the single window or the options and we are aiming for, especially to global connection. Uh, what I forget to say in my introduction is that um, um, uh, Portnet Maroc, in personal Youssef Awusi, today is also our African uh, representative of IPCSA. Next, next we move to air freight. A couple of weeks back, I had a meeting, a UN meeting, and I, uh, I introduced the power of water. And apart from the power of water, where we are all know the port community systems from, we should not underestimate what's happening in the air. Um, look today, with the COVID-19 materials, which must be shipped from one place to another place in hours. 
uh, fresh food, fresh goods, and don't forget about e-commerce. So I'm very happy that apart from the seaport community systems, we also can represent on the various levels the cargo community systems. And I'm very happy to have today online Ahmad Moore, uh, CEO of Kale Logistics, uh, operating, let's say, the Mumbai um, the cargo community system today. And I learned, um, Amar, a couple of weeks back that you're also now involved in Dubai, which is a great um, success for you, of course, and congratulate with that. And not forget, um, uh, Calais Logistics is our Asia Pacific representative. Amar, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you so much, Hans. Uh, very good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, wherever you are across the world. Uh, it's a pleasure to be talking to all of you at this very uh, important milestone in IPSCA. I mean, the work that Hans and Richard are doing is phenomenal and pioneering, and we are so proud to be part of IPSCA. Also, uh, you know, with all sympathies to our great friend, in fact, crusader of, uh, you know, community platforms, Dominic, uh, may God rest his soul in peace. And with this, uh, you know, today I will talk about uh, air, airport cargo community platform. Now, this is a very interesting uh, subject, as Hans said, port community systems uh, have been there for a very long time. I mean, uh, there was a fantastic slide by Javier, which kind of explained to you the whole journey of port community systems, right? With air, uh, although air is very time sensitive, uh, you know, we, we always had a very different situation. Most of the community platforms that were created for the air cargo industry were created by the airlines. And airlines by their very nature are not centered around one airport, you know, or port, right? So they are, they are multi-locational by nature. So, so when this whole digitization started uh, <clears throat> in this uh, air cargo space and the whole journey around creating, uh, you know, EDI or community platforms, uh, those platforms in the early days were essentially facilitating digital transactions between the freight forwarders and the airlines or the airlines and customs, right? So, so that was the scope of, uh, you know, the community platforms in the air. There were a couple of exceptions. There was Cargonaut, which was created around a port, uh, which is obviously Amsterdam. And then there was CIN, which was around Paris, right? So these were uh, the only two things that came closer to being a port community system, right? But everything else was more like cargo community system and the difference that Richard just explained, right? However, times are changing, as uh, you know, uh, Hans also explained and we need to change so in the air now the focus is shifting from you know broad based cargo community systems which just facilitate uh, a couple of transactions between one stakeholder and the other to creating communities around the airports and this is the journey that has been undertaken and ipsca is very active in promoting this kind of uh, airport cargo community systems and uh, you know they're going to drive the future uh, innovation in the air cargo industry for sure so uh, coming to the air cargo uh, and uh, you know the kind of uh, challenges that uh, you know we face in the air cargo business which is essentially you know and i always jokingly say this right uh, the, the first air cargo shipment was accompanied by just one document called air weapon and today we've got uh, on an average with each air cargo shipment around 30 documents and 120 copies of paper and about 200 signatures right even today in this day and age and though some of those documents are commercial invoice packing list letter of instruction certificate of origin uh, master error bill house error bill etc etc right so so over a period of time uh, you know this whole thing got complicated and i think most of the audience today understands the importance of uh, the community platforms of creating communities. But, you know, it is also important to note the journey that, you know, from a very simple uh, uh, paperwork, we have moved to a lot of complexity over a period of time. Another uh, reason why, you know, this whole concept of airport cargo community system is coming into place, which is parallel of port cargo community system, is this high truck congestion at the airports, right? 
so a lot of airports you know uh, due to their very nature of catering to passengers are close to or nearby or within the cities right and uh, you know movement of trucks for cargo handling does create you know several restrictions congestion uh, around the airports and in order to address airports you need to create this kind of platforms that can streamline the flow uh, of shipments that can reduce this paperwork that happens uh, so on and so forth similarly uh, there is no shipment visibility uh, you know a single point shipment visibility to an exporter importer especially when uh, you know uh, it is such a time critical and an expensive mode of transport right there is an expensive mode of transport so uh, in terms of the quality of transportation you know this is something that is very important we have changing regulations we have challenges around data security and this is the funny part you know those who create these platforms are asked what happens to my data security but those who are trading on paper you know <laughs> they don't know that their data can be exchanged even without their knowledge by somebody working at a ground level and you know that 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 is a serious issue right then there is this uh, you know uh, uh, inability to share data in advance with the cargo terminal operators at the airports actually doesn't help them plan their operations better and since in air cargo the moves the the moves or the goods have to move uh, very fast uh, advance information is absolutely uh, needed for this air co airport cargo terminal operators for processing the data so some of these challenges uh, have actually led to this concept gaining serious ground right and and another very important statistics for all of you the air cargo stays on ground for 85% of the time so the only reason for which the customer pays which is faster movement is only 15% of the total time so to derive there is so much value to be unlocked in air cargo through digitization or through the community platforms that you know you will realize the potential i mean it's just 85% of the time the cargo lying on ground right and that's where we see uh, the airport cargo community platforms gaining ground now now you know what are airport community platforms i i would you know uh, mark them as airport cargo single window okay so all the stakeholders that are involved in the airport cargo operations or air cargo operations providing them the single window of operation when they are dealing with air cargo so whether it is importers exporters freight forwarders transporters banks shipper consignees all of them communicating uh, through a common platform again another important statistics uh, that uh, you know most of this data across this 124 copies of paper is the same and there is tremendous amount of data reusability 67% of the data that's created by importer exporter in his system can be reused to generate most of these documents across the supply chain that's the level of reusability that's available with us and that's where uh, you know one would like to seriously promote this whole concept of uh, airport cargo community platform okay moving on to uh, you know what these platforms do uh, uh, for uh, you know uh, for the community essentially uh, when we're talking about uh, you know the airport uh, cargo communities uh, when when it started uh, those were just uh, you know those were just the first generation communities uh, which were uh, simple web portals at the airports for viewing uh, you know flight schedules right and that was that was the stuff that uh, kind of existed then now afterwards you know the journey moved on to creating this second generation acs which was all about uh, you know creating this online terminal charges payments so whatever payments used to happen at the airport started happening uh, you know online then you had this truck dock appointment booking you know that became a big thing and uh, you know uh, concepts like smart gate which is what cargo not put together in amsterdam and interface with customs that that's what was the second generation of airport cargo community system was now the next generation of airport cargo community system has definitely has to do more and that more means uh, facilitating communication between the exporter and forwarder between the airlines and forwarder between the forwarder and customs you know between the uh, airlines and customs and you know all these processes that happen at the uh, airport you know could be done online 
uh, including streamlining the uh, you know movement of uh, uh, trucks at the airport. So whether it is electronic airway bill, electronic booking, electronic delivery orders, electronic consignment security declaration, connecting multiple airports through digital corridors. This is what we try to do between Mumbai and Amsterdam through a digital corridor concept. And I think uh, you know IPSCA's trusted of trusted networks is uh, you know something that uh, uh, really uh, kind of aligns with that. And then advanced shipment information to cargo terminal operators, so on and so forth. You can you can integrate the certificate of origin and several other features. And that's the future. That's the next generation of airport cargo community systems that have to come into play, right? This slide just talks about, you know, so, so how do I touch and feel it? You know, what is there in the community platform? So these are all different features that will be available for stakeholders that are not available through any airport cargo portal today. Today, most of these airport, airports have static cargo portals giving information about, uh, you know, their terminals, their facilities, and so on and so forth. So from that, they need to move into complete communities, you know, which will provide a single window for information exchange or data exchange between these participants, right? So that's, that's, that's what it means, okay? And in terms of functional architectures, well, all of us understand that you know most uh, port community systems, cargo community systems, or air airport cargo community systems should have a web portal, a web portal that is linked to an airport's uh, you know website or uh, you know some other URL, right? It should have different utilities in terms of access on the handheld devices, mobile apps, automatic SMSs, or uh, WhatsApp messaging, right? And you know payment gateways, right? They have to have the deep tech interventions of interfacing with drones, blockchains, and AI and ML. And I think I'll spend a couple of minutes on these deep tech interventions in air cargo community system as we go along. And then finally, other value additions <coughs> of linking to other airports through digital corridors to grow business between the two airports. You know, uh, bureau services wherein you can convert uh, you know PDF documents into electronic data and move it between the stakeholders, connect to cargo handling systems, and then you know, uh, <coughs> uh, connect to different stakeholder systems through EDI and APIs, right? So these are different fulfillment mechanisms, and this is the functional architecture of an airport cargo community platform. So let me spend a couple of minutes on uh, you know, this deep tech intervention. So what can the airport cargo community systems do with drones, right? <coughs> Well, uh, at many of these airports, uh, tracking the inventory or where exactly the cargo is at which location, uh, and that, that, that's very important even for the e-commerce service providers because for them, when the cargo is under their control on their planes or their trucks, they have complete visibility. But when it typically goes to the airports, uh, they lose the visibility. So, so providing that visibility when the cargo is at the airport warehouses, it's possible through drones because you are talking about multi-story warehouses uh, and you know multiple layers and they're you know tracking the location of shipments by tracking barcodes through drone and maintaining inventory uh, is one thing that we have tried out you know and that's something that works uh, it also has uh, wherever there are pilferages uh, you know these drones in the warehouses also act as a deterrent for against those pilferages so it serves uh, the security purpose cloud based obviously all of these solutions will have to be cloud based uh, and that's the nature of the beast today or any community platform uh, today which is not cloud based has very limited reach right blockchain when you connecting uh, you know two different airports or through two different community platforms through an airport blockchain is that trusted uh, you know technology which can engender uh, you know that trust due to the nature of the technology so that's something uh, that we have done, uh, you know, when we created the world's first airfare digital corridor, right? Artificial intelligence and machine learning, where can you use that? So, you know, for managing uh, the flow of trucks at the cargo terminals, wherein you have to do the dock assignment of the truck when the truck comes to the airport, well, that dock assignment can be based on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, if there's a truck that's going from Atlanta to Paris, uh, you know, on every Tuesday, uh, uh, you know, from DHL or SEVA or whoever is the freight forwarder, right? Now, if if uh, if the system understands that it typically takes about 35 minutes at particular dock, 
then when the when the system is doing the dock assignment uh, you know that's the time when uh, you can use this artificial intelligence and do that right similarly you know uh, those stakeholders who do not have the ability to connect uh, their systems with this kind of community platforms and they do not want to enter data onto the portals for them uh, to come on board and uh, benefit from this technology you've got uh, another solution wherein you can extract data uh, using machine OCR and machine learning and convert it into uh, the format that's understood by the other party and send it there. IoT, this is another thing that we did. Uh, when vaccine was moving, it was important to track temperatures uh, of the vaccines and you know those temperature tracking devices, connecting it to the community platforms and then giving that visibility through community platform mobile apps actually create improve the quality of transportation allowed the vaccine manufacturers to know what the temperatures of the vaccines is when the vaccine is at the airport so these are some of the use cases and deep tech interventions that uh, you know we have experimented with uh, in the next generation air cargo community system so i'm not going to get into details of uh, you know uh, this because i think uh, i've got about four minutes left uh, but clearly there are commercial benefits, there are benefits related to business growth and obviously sustainability and security. Uh, clearly the uh, airports can attract, you know, more airlines and more importers, exporters uh, by having such kind of platforms which improve quality of transportation, right? Uh, there are different commercial models where the airports can actually earn revenues by providing this kind of digital services through the platform and uh, you know uh, it's a great marketing tool for most of the airports it makes airports uh, attractive uh, you know uh, uh, for other airports to do business for the airlines to come down uh, the cargo airlines especially and most important sustainability reduce carbon footprint because the uh, because of less consumption of, of fuel by the trucks uh, because of uh, elimination of paper i mean you know we are doing a a project at uh, Mumbai airport, which is world's most constrained airport, right? Uh, wherein we are eliminating six documents per shipment, right? Uh, on the import side. Now for an airport that has got about 6,000 shipments uh, every day, this translates into elimination of 8 million copies of paper over a an year. And that tantamounts to saving 1,500 trees. So that, that's the kind of impact that you can have by having such kind of a system in just one airport. Now imagine there are thousands of airports, at least, you know, uh, at least about 400, 500 cargo focused airports. And, you know, that's something uh, that can be delivered uh, to the ecosystem, operational efficiency, cost reduction, compliance. I mean, you know, I don't want to, uh, you know, preach to the converted already, but these are the benefits that, uh, you know, all of us know uh, the community platforms have. Uh, whether you are a, a freight forwarder who is busy running from, I mean, these are orchestrators of uh, uh, freight. So they are uh, busy running with these documents from pillar to post. If they get a single window, so much of improvement can happen in their processes. Cargo handling agents know what's coming in when, and they can plan their resources at the warehouse better. And, you know, they, they can benefit immensely by reducing congestion and helping, helping more cargo move through their facilities. And airlines, you know, they have to comply with e-freight and several other uh, initiatives in the industry. They can do that very easily as well, right? Truckers, you know, who have to deal with 10-hour rules and all these other different kinds of rules, they can do that as well. Shippers and consignees, their inventory cost can go down, right? So I think uh, with this, I'm coming towards the end of my presentation. I just wanted to tell you about Mumbai Airport, which is officially world's most constrained airport. It handles more than 1,000 flights on a single runway, right? They just have one runway and the other is just a fallback runway. And this is a Google Earth view there. This, this tiny little facility, which is equivalent to any, any individual forwarder's warehouse anywhere in Europe or in the North America, actually processes close to 1 million tons of cargo per year without any great material handling system. And this small lane that you see here, that processes 1,500 trucks a day because the airport is in the heart of the city, right? And they're able to do that primarily because these trucks used to stand here and then all the documentation of paperwork used to happen here. That's all happening before the truck even enters the queue and truck enters the queue today with the truck driver having uh, a mobile app uh, and a QR code. And that's all that they need. And then they go and load and unload cargo 
and that's how efficient it has become. So Mumbai, by the way, is world's most efficient airport in terms of cargo handling. And that has been possible only because of uh, you know this thing that we've done. This this project also received an uh, award at the United Nations uh, uh, for for doing this uh, this particular transformation. And I think that's it. Uh, last one minute that I have a brief introduction of Kale. Just like IPCSA, uh, we celebrated our 10 years of evolving journey a few months back. We've got about 4,500 customers across 27 countries. We do represent uh, on several industry associations. We have won two awards uh, for from United Nations, one for our airport cargo community system and one for our uh, you know container digital exchange, or codex, right? Uh, and you know we created North America's first airport cargo community system, and now we are creating such systems across 20 other airports globally. So thank you so much for your patient listening. I'll be very happy to answer all the questions. And congratulations to all the founding members and Hans and Richard again on the 10th anniversary. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amar, for your extensive explanation about the air cargo and uh, what's happening in the air cargo industry and the importance of that. And especially, of course, the trade facilitation you have to, to reduce dwell times, to reduce waiting times and to get the cargo in time from one place to another place. Thank you so much. And I'm sure there will be questions afterwards. Our next speaker is uh, Uwe Liefner. Uwe Liefner is uh, our customers representative on EU level, um, I can say actually on uh, on global level. And uh, well, he represents us for a long, long time already and uh, we are very happy to have him online today. Today, Uwe will not talk about the customs so far, maybe during the questionnaire we can hit upon that. But Uwe will talk about our IPCSA family. A family, association formal, yes. Friendship, yes. Transparency, yes. But overall, IPCSA is a family, a real family, a family of system operators having the same view, same thoughts, same goal, trade facilitation, enhance the trade facilitation. So, Uwe, the family is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Hans. Uh, hello to everyone. Uh, I, I was thinking about to disappoint you, Hans, about my content, but now you said it to the audience that, uh, yes, I'm not going to bore you now uh, with uh, customs matters. I'm more here to take you on a journey through a success story from 10 years of an association and, uh, as Hans introduced now, uh, a family. I'm going to share with you... Um, my slides, um, I hope it will work now. Share screen, there you go. All right, here we are. I hope you can see them. Good. So, yes, I'm, I like to invite you to come with me on a journey through the years from a little bit another viewpoint than uh, Richard did it in the beginning. Um, so let's start. Uh, as you can see, once upon a time in a oh, kingdom, Lord oh, okay. Yes? All right. Everybody can see it? Can you just put it on full screen? Anyway. It is on full screen. Ah, uh, wait a moment. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you just need to click on one of the full screen. Uh, left hand, top left hand icon. No. Ah, gosh. I can't find it. Wait a moment. 
I see you hit the button on the, the right side down of the screen, but it doesn't work so far. So I would say, uh, we'll just continue. Okay. Wait a moment. Then we are going to start again. There we are. <clears throat> so, yes. So I would like to take you on the journey uh, through the last years from another viewpoint. So let's start. Once upon a time in the kingdom, not that far away, the Belgian uh, participants in the webinar, they will, uh, yeah, recognize themselves. Some delegates of member states came together behind closed doors to discuss one issue. How can we be sure that the captain who is going to enter our port is a peaceful and calm one and not Sir Francis Drake? So um, they found a typical European solution for that to make the ports a little bit safer. They went out and said, let us force the salesmen to declare themselves that they are fine. That was the launch of the Blue Belt Initiative and the Reporting Formalities Directive, so a typical European story. At the same time, something happened in the headquarters of secret services around the globe. What do we need then? How bring safety on another level? The magic word was data. Where do we get that data from? So they went out and they organized their own G7 summit. Not in Cornwall this time because of two nice beaches for swimming activities. So they thought we should go or send our PCS agents to another unsuspicious place to launch our double zero mission or program. Do you want to move your screen slides forward a couple? Richard, was it for me now? Yeah, for you. We're missing your screen. You haven't uh, progressed any of your presentation. You might want to reshare your slides. I think then I'm going to ask now Alex for uh, going to the PDF. PDF. So there we go. Yes. Here we are. Ah, there we are. So, <clears throat> so they organized their own uh, G7 summit, as I said, not in Cornwall this time because of swimming activities. It was uh, more to have an unsuspicious place. And if you believe it or not, uh, Six, the six founding members of IPCSA um, came up, it came together in the entertainment district of Amsterdam. So I don't know what might be a better place to go for such an association. But then they asked themselves, we are six, uh, where is 007? And you can see uh, 007 jumped into the game it was Richard. Um, there you go. Ten years later, where we are, from Hangzhou to Santiago de Chile, from Abu Dhabi via Djibouti to Casablanca, from Sydney to Los Angeles, from Mumbai to Odessa, from Tel Aviv to back to Europe. IPCSA and its members are recognized as a knowledgeable, supportive, constructive, trusted partner for 
all stakeholders means private and public. And not only in their local environment, we are recognized now worldwide uh, amongst the leading organizations and institutions as a valuable partner. As you can see, I have listed now on my slide here some of them, and I guess um, Hans and Richard mentioned some of them. Uh, I'm, because I'm the customs uh, nerd of IPCSA, going to focus myself now on one of that names on the list. It is from the EU Commission, the uh, di Director uh, General of Tax Suit, which is the responsible unit for taxes and customs. And since I joined IPCSA in 2013, um, we attended in, I don't know how many work groups now and uh, several other uh, meetings on that EU level to bring in our practical experience. And uh, I can tell you the naked truth, the commission likes us, not because we are that nice people uh, or not because we are only nice people. It is more that um, we came at the right time uh, when also the customs organizations in Europe started to go on their way on the next to the next level of digitalization and electronic uh, and the implementation of new electronic systems. So um, it was the right time for IPCSA to come into the game and to give some experiences out of the field to the Commission. Um, I state that nearly each and every time that uh, in, in every meeting we are invited to, the community is the key and the driver of the success in and for our business. Community in the meaning of business, yes, but IPCSA moved on to the next level uh, from community approach to really being a family. And I guess the previous speakers said it several times. Um, in my initial presentation, I was up to present a slide with some thoughts about uh, what we have experienced in the last years as the funny family. Means, bars, dance floors, beach parties. But um, yeah, the sad news from the weekend. Let me take a hold. And uh, I rearranged my slides to say thank you. When I met Dominic, we had a great time and a relaxed evening with a lot of funny moments. Thinking back, I have to say that he was that what IPSCA stands for. And we can all be proud of. We are experts in our field, like Dominic. We are relaxed and positive people, like Dominic. We have fun together at the right time. Yes, like Dominic. In my personal life, I connect a lot of things to music. This time, I've got immediately the well-known French chanson, La Mer, into my mind. So, Dominic, you will stay in our hearts and uh, you are part, you, was, you were part and you will be a part of our family. Merci. We are not only uh, here uh, to, to oh, when we are talking about the family approach and the family, what we are established over the years, then I have to clearly say that, yes, it's a people's business. And I represent today one of the founding members here, which is DBH from Bremen. And uh, DBH has sent as uh, the other uh, founding members some words of appreciation and to summarize the last years signed by our CEO. The message is clear. We are proud to be part of the family and we are looking forward to the common activities for shaping the future together in the family. 
Last but not least, I would like to say a personal thank to the heart of the family, which is, or who is, not which, who is Richard. And I would like to do that with an example. The first time when Richard came along to visit me in my own house here in the woods on top of the Aura Mountains, he came in to my living room and he stopped for a moment and he said, it's strange, but we have the same furniture. What I would like to say with that is that we are brothers in mind and over the years we became very close friends. So. Thank you, Richard. And at the end of my very short journey through the years, uh, I like to, even that we have that sad news for you today, I like to invite you all to say cheers with us and uh, raise the glass, uh, celebrate a little bit 10 years of IPCSA. And uh, yeah looking forward to take you on the journey into the future as i said so you are welcome to follow us on our way and support us thank you very much for your attention thanks i hand over back to hans Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, uh, Uwe, for your kind words and especially the, um, the words towards the family and MGI about uh, Dominique, um, a big loss for all of us. Um, I would like to have all participants back now on the floor for the Q&A session, which will start as soon as possible. And we're waiting for the sixth one with this, um, in addition to, uh, to our two-day session, and it's about uh, our expert in uh, <coughs> standardization and harmonization, Nico de Kauer. I hope he will um, join us very soon. There's Nico. And Yusef. So we are all back on floor now, isn't it? Um, just a moment. I need to do something, but uh, I hope it works. Not yet, but okay, let's see. Thank you all for, uh, for giving presentations and uh, Nico for joining us now for uh, giving some highlights on standardization and harmonization. I saw some, some questions in the meantime. I don't know whether they are particular for yourself, but uh, okay, let's see how that, uh, that will be handled. Um, thank you to the audience, and I hope the audience is still able to concentrate for the Q&A because a session of two hours, normally when we see each other eye to eye, it's, it's quite easy with the networking, with some coffee breaks in between, but sitting behind the screen and get concentrated on all the information you got, it's, uh, it's not easy, but uh, thank you all for uh, participating and uh, being online and see a lot of questions coming up. But uh, before starting the uh, Q&A session, I would like your attention for the PTM recognition. Recognition is, in honor of Pichon Tentei, a vice president, a vice chairman of IPCSA, and who has taken before his time in 2014, leaving behind a wife and family. IPCSA wanted to recognize Pichon's passion, energy, and enthusiasm for ports, logistics, and community systems, and to honor his commitment to IPCSA. Me, as third custodian of Pichon's memory, within IPCSA, instigated a recognition award of work done by individuals and organizations for support to support the development of IPCSA and who follow the value of PTANS had in his life. With today's sad news in our mind about Dominique, I would uh, announce that for the fourth time, we reach out the recognition. This time, to our anchorman in the field of standardization and harmonization, Nico de Kauer. I see your smile, Nico. You didn't know this, but <laughs> we knew. 
right? Nico has and is still supporting us in our goal for standardization. He actively represents us as one of the experts in the IMO4 harmonization work and is a trusted representative of IPCSA and is regularly called upon by the IMO to provide his insights and experience on standards and harmonization. Since the beginning of the work, originally managed by the WCO, Nico has actively participated in development of the work at IMO and is also leading the UN CFEC project for the update of the IFTDGM message. Nico, as a member of PROTECT and IPCSA, was one of a number of the IPCSA members who supported the integration of PROTECT into IPCSA. IPCSA is now recognized around the world as not only an advocate of standardization and harmonization, but an active player in supporting the international standard bodies to work together. And this is the biggest success Nico has had on behalf of IPCSA. Dear Nico, on this memorable date, day, and although under the sad circumstances, I want to congratulate you in name of our founding members. Raising them myself with this well-deserved recognition. In the meantime, and I tried to get in contact with your and my big friend, John Kerkhoff, will be at yours to hand over a present with all kinds of delicious things. The awards I will bring myself when I'm back home and allowed to visit Belgium, depending on the COVID-19 restrictions. Thank you, Nico, for your dedication and support. So let's see but I can find John Kerakoff <laughs> in one way or the other he is not responding but um, maybe it's my phone I don't know but he knows the time so he must be around within a couple of minutes I hope maybe he's waiting in your garden I don't know <laughs> uh, just checking <laughs> yeah. right so very much pleased and congratulations uh, Nico and uh, in name of Pete Jan uh, the award is yours and uh, I hope to bring it up to you within a couple of weeks and to celebrate it over there together of course Erwin knows about it <laughs> but he couldn't be there because there's a board member today yeah. so uh, yeah that's it well I'm trying to get to John but in one way the other doesn't work right later on um, so let's see let's see thank you nico for everything you've done for us it's been great working with you uh you answer whatsapp messages every minute of the day night and weekend that i send you yeah. <laughs> whether it's to do with standards or having a beer so thank you for everything you've done for us on behalf of all of the members thank you thank you very much uh, for this award this uh, this really means a lot to me and and uh, yeah i like you said i didn't know it so i'm i'm actually a bit overwhelmed <laughs> it doesn't happen that much to me but uh, even on on my old age now i'm i can still be overwhelmed uh, because that, yeah, that's that's a bit how it feels now um yeah of course uh, 10 years being a dip uh, um it's it's of course not only me doing some some work but it's actually the the, the drive of the uh, ipsa family the enthusiasm uh, also deepest beliefs in in what we can achieve uh, in, in supply chains through digitalization uh, it's it all inspires me uh, to to invest in and find the time to to do something for for ipsa so uh, i have to thank all of you for for your contributions uh, which makes my contributions much much easier um yeah of course also my my deepest condolences and, and sympathies towards uh dominique's uh yeah colleagues but especially uh, his family um yeah so through through this award and, and and this appreciation i think dominique will always take a prominent place in in our activities our life but also especially in in, in mine so with this with this award I will always uh, remember him as well. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Okay. It's a real pleasure. Um, in the meantime, I tried to contact um, uh, John uh, to find uh, the whereabouts about John because he should be on your phone board, but I don't get connection. I will try again. Maybe Richard, you can take over for a moment the Q&A because there are a lot of Q&As um, appearing. 
uh, to our um, um, to our panelists. So would you be so kind to do so? Then I'll try to contact uh, John. Okay, thank you all. Um, and thank you everybody uh, for staying so long. We've got time for a number of questions. We have one from Michelle Lynch asking about your view on the current level of technology and adoption and maturity throughout the supply chain. And what do you think the immediate challenge is being faced for those who are lagging behind? How are those who are not in the first phase of technology going to catch up? Yusuf, Javier, have you got any thoughts on that? Well, it's, uh, it's difficult to say uh, how to, but I think that if you are not in the technology, you will be out of the game uh, quite soon. I think if you don't uh, realize that if you don't put your business into the digital world, I mean, probably in in a few in a few days, in a few weeks, few months, maybe you'll be out of the game. I think this is something that we should consider quite quite clear. Unfortunately, maybe. I totally yes. agree. With you. I, I totally agree with you, Javier. It's um, it's uh, keeping keeping uh, up with the new technologies is uh, very important for uh, for the logistic industry. If, uh, yeah, and the supply chain. If it's uh, not done, we can uh, rapidly be um, out of the game. And uh, we see that a uh, lot of uh, new players, digital freight forwarders are coming, that are um, uh, using uh, full digital to uh, serve better their customers. So uh, I think uh, uh, the adoption of uh, technology is uh, very important so we can keep up with them um, and not be disrupted with the with technology. Okay, thank you, Yosef. Amar, what's your views? And add on to that a question from Joanne Waters, talking about, asking a question about with the move to the increased use of technology. Do you foresee that there's going to be a skill shortage in the future? Um, yeah. as, we're, as they're seen in other parts of the supply chain. What are your thoughts on that, Amar? So, so Richard, uh, I'm sorry, I've just switched, switched off my video, not because I have, I'm not looking good now, but uh, <laughs> just to conserve some bandwidth, right? So uh, uh, very quickly, uh, I think, uh, Richard, in fact, all our members and port community system providers in general have a role or, you know, we can play a role wherein those who are laggards or those who are a little unfortunate when it comes to technology, can we kind of, you know, take them along? Is there a method to take them along, right? Now, one of the ways in which this could be done is clearly, you know, the port community systems or airport community systems or cargo community systems, their primary role is to facilitate digital interactions between different stakeholders right but could we make those platforms you know as channels for rolling out something very basic in terms of technology because most of these are cloud-based systems so something that can help these freight forwarders or customs brokers you know do some minimal operations on the cloud i mean those who are the have-nots of uh, uh, technology could that be done? I mean, you know, uh, that's something uh, that I think we need to think about. Uh, we feel it is possible because to digitize the data and to exchange the data, uh, you know, you need to create that data. And that's something that can be done. I also believe that this kind of community platforms actually do democratization of technology, right? Because there are people, you know, who spend billions of dollars into uh, technology for, you know, data exchange, technology for efficiency enhancement. But if if this kind of community platforms give the same ability to smaller players, then you are actually democratizing their technology. Now, let me give you another example. Uh, you know, uh, for example, when we started uh, this initiative in a country like India, wherein people were still using typewriters to, you know, generate their airway bills or whatever kind of documents, right? Uh, or maybe uh, very old legacy desktop based systems. We had this challenge uh, where they didn't want to come onto the, uh, to the portal and re-enter that data again, because they were either typing the data or creating that into some, you know, standalone desktop based system. 
and they had zero ability to develop APIs with the platform. So we said, how could we take these people on this journey of data exchange? You know, how could we effectuate that? And that's where we thought about an innovation wherein they could just exchange the PDF copies of the documents that they created. We could, uh, using machine learning and OCR, extract uh, the data from those documents, convert it into electronic data, and move it across uh, the supply chain. So I think uh, you know there is something that we all can do for those have-nots of technology and just just try to lift lift these guys a little bit. In fact, uh, community systems can become channels for other service providers to roll out their small enterprise systems. You know, so smaller systems that can get these guys who are still on paper-based operations onto this uh, you know digitization journey. So, so that's my view. Now, coming to your second question on skills and skill shortage, right? Now, uh, when we talk about skill shortage, well, definitely, absolutely, uh, you find that uh, you know in every aspect of logistics industry, in, including truck driving, to you know uh, the the CIOs, right? And uh, uh, that's something uh, that uh, that we face and we will continue to face. So I think we need to work very closely uh, with the, uh, you know, academicia in the countries uh, that we operate in or at maybe at an international level and, uh, you know, kind of uh, come up with, uh, you know, short term courses which can get these different stakeholders, uh, you know, uh, a sneak peek into, uh, you know, digitization or technology and what these people can specifically do. Uh, you know, in their own job, you know, what kind of technology adoption can they have? I mean, the, such such kind of crash courses have already been uh, taken care of in some of the leading business schools across the world. I know uh, a few uh, in, in France and, you know, that's happening uh, in several aviation universities. So, yes, skill shortage is, uh, is an area. Uh, as a technology service provider, you can uh, move towards providing... Uh, completely idiot proof systems as they say or you know the other word to that is uh, user friendly so systems that you know use uh, any kind of user can use on you know any any kind of device so so uh, like the mobile phones or handheld devices etc and and this is how we are going to address this skill shortage uh, 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 issue that we continue to face so so that's it from me uh, richard thank you Thank you, Omar. I like the term idiot proof. That's much better than user friendly. <laughs> and I think we have a short intermission while our delivery has arrived. Yes. Sure. <laughs> uh, we switch back to Nico. And in the meantime, our secret agent, John Karakoff, <laughs> and brought a big present to you, uh, Nico. So we are very sorry that we had to cheat you and to, to get you online to, st to say something about standardization or harmonization, but I hope you will stay online because I see from the Swedish um, uh, Maritime Administration the question about standardization, so maybe you can answer that. But in the meantime, John, welcome. Uh, Nico, I think you already got the present in the meantime. Not yep. impact yet. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit heavy, so I don't know if I can present it for a very long time, but... Uh... Uh, oh, no. like this <laughs> yes and, and of course you need to put them in the in the fridge yeah, yeah. The, i think I need yeah, to to yeah yeah and you're not allowed to drink any of them until you meet us next time okay yeah. <laughs> it will be very short i, I promise you i will I'll buy, I'll buy an extra luggage then yeah. <laughs> thank you very much uh, okay, and, and as Hans says, there's nothing as a free lunch. So Uv Ulf from Swedish Maritime Administration asked about how about standards to support future systems? What do you see the standards and future technology you see? So you need to say a few words to yeah. justify being on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, of course, um, st standards for, for future um, purposes are, are very important. Eh? Uh, standards are there for a very long, long time already. In the last few years, people uh, often said that there are no standards, which is, of course, not true, but they are not, uh, not used oft often uh, and enough. Um, but they're already there for, for 20 years. The, 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 
the purpose of standards is, is getting more and more import, important, in fact. Um, but also, we, in the last five or ten years, we saw a, a huge divergence of standards. People also uh, self-proclaiming uh, their own standards, uh, which is also uh, a bit difficult, in, in my opinion. Um, but, but anyway, you have, you have different standard data models. Uh, for instance, you have World Customs Organization, you have ISO, you have UNECE, and, and there are uh, some, some others as well. Um, so that became a problem eh, in the last years. So uh, we at, at IPCSA, we tried to search for some, some convergence again, eh, where you can exchange um, standards and, and standard messages uh, through the use of the different data models. And there comes, of course, the, the, the terminology of harmonization. Uh, harmonization being um, sort of in, interoperable, um, interoperable standards. So, uh, which means that you have a message in, in one standard data model and one in the other that you can communicate through different uh, messages, in fact, but that you have your semantics, so that you know that the vessel name at the one hand is a transport means name at, at, the, at the other end. Um, so that, that's a bit the importance where we are working towards in, in the last few years, but certainly in, in, in the next future of the next five or ten years uh, as well. So, so it, they will get more and more important. Also, because you have you have lots lots of different types of technology, uh, and all those types of technology have to converge in in one way or the other towards uh, standards. So the, the importance will will rise uh, still in the next years. Thank you, Nico. And now I think it's time can, for your can I ask? <laughs> can I ask something from the native speaker to add to that point? Is harmonization from the same uh, word family like harmful? So maybe that explains a little bit what uh, Nico was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Uwe. And while you're on, Uwe, you have a question, or we have a question on customs for you. Uh, so you don't get away with uh, not saying anything either. So Yappa Bandera has asked that the real question of implementation of technology enabled data sharing is coming from the government side, particularly the systems and customs. How do you think that the challenge of integration with custom systems, both for ports and airports, need to work? What's the biggest challenge for customs integrating with these ports and airport community systems? And that's from Sri Lanka, who uses Asakuda. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think the biggest challenge is, uh, like everywhere, is uh, communication and the community itself. So sit down together and uh, talk to each other. That's the first thing. Um, maybe I can step a bit to, to answer that question a little bit more in detail, a bit back into our history of our company, DBH. Uh, I used to, to uh, explain that very often because uh, it's uh, sometimes really surprising. Uh, we started our business in the PCS environment in 1973. Uh, and from the very first beginning, um, a number of, of stakeholders, and I tell you now the number, 110 came together to sit down and to work on uh, a common approach. And within that 110, customs administration was involved as well. So uh, only to give you an idea that uh, from the very first beginning and from the start, talking to each other is uh, yeah, the main or one of the key elements. Um, the challenges uh, to, to bring the things together is on the one hand, uh, uh, the, the legal framework, the right legal framework having in place, um, that means that customs is on the public sector side allowed to uh, accept uh, uh, electronic data uh, for each and every declaration. That's the first thing to have, as I said, the right legal framework. And the second one, I guess, is then really to find on the public sector side um, the right mandate. That means who is going to be the driver in, in the whole activity to bring on the public sector side uh, the involved parties and, and concerned and competent authorities together. And then uh, how to drive that whole business into the direction of connecting the private sector side. 
And uh, yeah, um, it makes no sense at the end when customs is going to uh, uh, establish a system. And uh, now we are back again in that communication side, on that communication side, that customs is, is establishing their own environment or the public sector side, and you are not able to talk to the private sector side and vice versa. So that's why go together, um, yeah. We can now talk for hours on that topic, uh, I'm sure, but uh, um, I don't know if I have answered the question a little bit in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that, Uwe. I have one more question for everybody to have an answer for before I hand back to Hans. Umar Mahmoud from Pakistan has asked, how can IPSCA help governments to learn from other governments' experience in adopting single window PCS and other technology driven trade initiatives? I think that's quite uh, an appropriate question, us celebrating our 10 year anniversary. How do you as members of IPSCA see our support for those types of things? Yosef is probably the first one to answer that. And then over to Javier, Amar, Nico and Uwe before back to Hans. Joseph. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, I think uh, we learn a lot from experience. Uh, we, uh, we learn a lot from our colleagues in uh, other PCS and other uh, single windows all over the, the world. Uh, I think um, bringing up uh, such organization uh, with a lot of um, uh, experience and uh, historical experience in, uh, in uh, tail facilitation, uh, standardization, harmonization of um, uh, things, a lot of for us. Uh, I think uh, from the point we uh, we joined the uh, IPSA, uh, we started uh, to uh, to see what uh, what is going uh, uh, in other countries and other in other organizations, so we can uh, more. Um, uh, prepare the future for our single windows and for our community and uh, we, we bring this experience to our community so we can explain how uh, you guys deal with uh, lots of uh, problematics in the ports, uh, trade, so we can, uh, we can uh, easily handle those problematic in Morocco. So uh, we, we use a lot of uh, from your, um, your experience and uh, sharing that uh, with them, um, sh sharing that experience in uh, such uh, uh, events and uh, uh, meetings that we had with all the, uh, our family from Ixa was uh, very useful for us uh, to um, uh, explore and uh, uh, propose new uh, ideas to, to our communities. Th thank you, Yosef. Javier, any thoughts on how IPSCA can support organizations, governments on PTS and other developments? I think that most of the things that you just have already explained, I think that we have a lot of experience uh, how we have managed all these um, issues in our, in our country. And, and I think this is really well appreciated in, in my case that I'm, I try to collaborate with, with some countries doing some uh, advisory services. And what is really important is that when we, what we share is, is the real experience. We are talking about actions. Uh, we are talking about facts. We are not talking about papers. It's more than than a consultant. But so our experience is based on real facts. And this is, this is what is really uh, appreciate that we used to say to the PCS is not an IT project, it's a change management project that you have to do step by step. Once When the countries and governments present that they want to build a system in two years, I think they say, well, you can build the system in two years, but put in place the adoptions and to, to do the things running, it takes years. It's nothing that you cannot do it the night to day. So this is something that we used to to say we have to explain and this is what is what is really meaningful for the for the comments to bring our to bring our real experience on the field thank you javier over to you amar what's your thoughts and what benefits have you had since joining ipsca no absolutely richard i think ipsca is probably the only organization where as javier explained we have got on-ground, hands-on, people with on-ground and hands-on experience 
of implementing maritime community systems, the port community systems, air cargo community systems, and single window systems, like my friend Yusuf explained. Right. So, so that's a repository of uh, you know knowledge that resides within ITSCA. Uh, you know what we believe, and uh, you know we kept telling our government and uh, you know people involved into. A ports activity from the public sector side, etc., to join IPSCA to leverage a law, leverage this whole repository of knowledge and actual experience. I think IPSCA should also consider doing workshops, uh, you know, for some of these governments uh, who would like to understand, you know, the experiences, the best practices uh, uh, across the globe. So I think these are different ways in which engagements, uh, you know, could happen with different governments. But it's important that you know uh, uh, people who want this to be implemented in their countries, they kind of tell their governments to become part of IPSCA so that these governments can uh, or these entities. Maybe you know, Richard, that Indian Ports Association is a member of IPSCA, right? And yep. and similar, uh, you know, uh, uh, port authorities, airport authorities could become part of IPSCA, and yep. that will benefit them greatly. So, uh, you know, I would advise people to you know speak to all those. Uh, public sector entities responsible for implementing systems like single window, ACS, and PCS to you know join IPSCA. Thank you, Amar. From a port authority side, Nico, and standard side, what do you see as what we can share with our experience um, to support other governments around the world? Yeah, if if I look to the situation of of uh, Port of Antwerp, uh, a very recent example, in fact, is. Yeah, for years we, we have uh, connections with our, our different governmental agencies like uh, customs, food agency and, and, and so on. But of course, apart from that, they, they also did yeah, their job uh, for uh, receiving de declarations and, and all those kind of things. And um, quite recent uh, customs came from, from their own side, came with the approach of we, we want to work only via a PCS. And so we are now setting that up like a sort of a gateway to government, and not only for customs, but also for the other ones, um, because they, they feel the need uh, more and more um, to consolidate the connections, to consolidate the, the data that is coming in, in into their systems. So I think uh, uh, that's a, a, a fast evolution in, in what PCS is also are doing. And some of them al already do that a uh, very long time, but, but you have others who are evolving towards that uh, uh, that same si situation. So um, so th that's a, rec a recent example of, of where we as, as Port of Antwerp and, uh, and can, can share our experience with other IPSA members. Thank you, Nico. And Uwe, Nico just mentioned about customs in Belgium moving towards the PCS. And I know you'd had long conversations with both Belgium and other customs authorities around Europe. How do you see IPSCA supporting particularly customs authorities in understanding these things? Yeah, I think um, we had a lot of talks uh, with uh, different layers of, of uh, players in, in the field. And uh, of course, the public sector is more and more interested because uh, um, they started to realize that digitization is uh, also on their side one of the key uh, activities for the next few years. Um, I can now answer in bullet points. So we, we have to think about the speed in the clearancing process when it comes now to really to customs activities, speed and clearancing. How do we really monitor and uh, have create an environment of transparency? What is uh, with uh, our comprehensive risk management and rule management on custom side? Can we extend that by using uh, other data providers and other data hubs uh, to, to contribute to that and make uh, our, our mandate of safety security uh, to fill that uh, fulfill that mandate much better? So um, there are a lot of things. Um, I would like to highlight uh, when you ask me, and, uh, how can IPCSA or how can PCS and single window operators um, give advice or help governments? Uh, I think one, one of the main, uh, beside the technology and beside uh, uh, really electronic exchange of data, it is more to, to make clear um, that uh, 
governments have to understand the concept behind the whole thing. Uh, and uh, it is not only about advanced countries. So it is really uh, understanding the concept and uh, making, making clear that an analysis of the domestic needs um, is the key uh, to, to move uh, forward and have the right progress uh, um, yeah, when you are looking for PCSs and when you are looking for establishing a single window environment. And that is then the last bullet point into operation so it's not uh, to to replace existing good ex or existing good uh, uh, operating systems. It is more to connect them together and uh, build up the linkage. So that is more, yeah, in a nutshell, my thought. Thank you all. Thank you all for that. And before I hand over to Hans, I'd just like to say once again, Nico, thank you for everything. You're part of the exclusive club of myself, Uwe, Javier and yourself uh, with this award. And I'm sure when we can all meet up again, we can all celebrate together. Back to you, Hans. Thank you, Richard, for taking over the Q&A while I was uh, searching for our secret agent in, uh, in Belgium to bring the package to, to Nico. So thank you so much for, for doing this. And I see in the, um, the questions, there are a few questions still open, but uh, be assured that uh, together with PTI, uh, PTI will get the information and we will answer you on the questions. There's one special for you as well, Amma. You might have seen that. But uh, we come back to that later. Thank you. Thank you, Nico, of course, for joining us. Um, excuses that we had to, um, to interfere in your, well, relax sitting back in the garden with a glass of wine. <laughs> That, that's the case. It's also my case today. I'm now having breakfast and within a couple of minutes I will go down to the beach and sit down and relax again. So, uh, well, we are in the same mood, but you are in the garden and me at the, at the Caribbean uh, Sea. Um, thank you all participants for, uh, for giving the, um, the approach and giving all the, um, the information about how you think about the future. What is happening in ports, what is happening in port areas, what is happening globally on air and on sea freight and on single window. So thank you so much for that. Thank you PTI for, um, for um, um, well, bringing us on the, uh, to the floor for being, let's say, the broadcasting this, uh, this brilliant session today with no hiccups. So um, thank you so much for all work done so far and we will be in contact with him soon again, of course. And, not, and last but not least, all participants, and I see there are still more than 100 online, uh, two hours of concentrating on subjects, on questions, etc., etc. So I hope you had a very fruitful uh, stay with us, a very informative stay with us, and do not um, hesitate to be in contact with us to see how we can find ways to join and find ways to work together. Thank you so much for everybody. And I will say, have a nice morning, daytime, and evening because we have participants from the US, from Europe, Middle East, towards Japan. So all over the ocean was um, looking to you all and uh, participated in this session. Thank you and bye for now. Thank you, everybody.